From the Bent Pixel Studios in Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Phone Booth Fighting, a weekly podcast talking about the world of mixed martial arts and beyond with myself, Richard Hunter, and that guy, UFC heavyweight champion twice over, current Bellator heavyweight, Frank Mir. And uh, Frank, we uh, have a big show to get to, uh, not the least of which is a very special guest that's going to be joining us in a moment, Super Sadiq Yusuf. I also voted today, so I need to uh, tell you guys. You, we, we. Uh, yeah, it's, I keep getting the updates on my phone because yeah. I, I did the online registration. Yes, the caucus week is uh, upon us here in Nevada, so the eyes of the uh, political world are, are on Nevada for the week. So uh, we'll be talking about that as well. Well, we're and, the most uh, representative, probably, of the diversity of the U.S. We really are. I, I feel you know, I mean, pretty close. Yeah. Large Latin, you know, population, <laughs> yep. you know. Uh, just, we are just you know some of the other places like Iowa and, and New Hampshire you know I mean we're the aren't first they like a high ninety percent white you know like, yeah we're the first real test if, yeah. in terms of that because yeah Iowa gets to go as the first caucus New Hampshire gets to go as the first primary but uh, uh, not nearly as uh, diverse up there we'll get to that here in just a little bit but joining us on the Skype right now Frank is uh, I am happy to say the number fifteen ranked. Uh, featherweight in the UFC. It's our friend Super Sadiq Yusuf. Welcome back to the show, Sadiq. How are you, man? Fantastic, man. Thank you guys for having me again. Of course. It's always fun to visit with you, but I've been waiting to see that ranking for a while. So now we can refer to you as uh, a uh, uh, ranked featherweight. I know that uh, victory over Andre Feely was a lot of us thought that was going to be the thing that put you uh, in that category and obviously it worked out. So how does it feel to finally get there? Yeah, yeah. Like when they announced the fight that I was going to get 50, that's kind of what I expected too. You know, he's kind of um, a good staple for the weight class to prove if you belong at the top or you belong with the rest of the division. Mm -hmm. So like I said, I was expecting it. Yeah. Now, Sadiq, uh, this is uh, going back to UFC 246. So that was, I guess, what, back in January. We we were working to get Sadiq on right after the fight, and we just haven't been able to line up our schedules. But uh, uh, this is our first time to check in with him since uh, he, he beat Andre Feely. But, uh, you know, going back to that fight for a second, Sadiq, uh, and I, I was there in person uh, you, you got to you got to show off some wrestling skills, which uh, you haven't really needed up to this point because you've been knocking guys out. But uh, that I think, in addition to the actual victory in the win column, is uh, an, another element of success. As you as you climb up those ranks, you always want to show matchmakers and fans uh, the different tools you got in the toolbox. So it had to be good to be able to showcase that. Yeah, for sure. It's um. It's funny, back in the amateur days, I was more of a submission guy, but as I kept on progressing in my martial arts journey and I started learning more tools, people started looking at, to me as more of a boxer, but it's not because of um anything that I purposely try to do, it's just the people around me and like the people I work with down here in D.C. is a lot of boxing prospects around here. Mm -hmm. But the people that are in the know, they know that I'm from a jiu-jitsu gym. I do jiu-jitsu yeah. more than I train anything else, you know. It's just the fight starts on the feet. So my coach always says if they can't answer your first question, you shouldn't ask them any more questions. So if, if I don't need it, I don't really try to force the issue. Yeah, I mean, coming from Lloyd Irvin's gym, you're absolutely right. That's a jiu-jitsu background. But, uh, right, jiu -jitsu. Yeah. <clears throat> it's just a hard thing for a lot of young guys to do, old guys too for that matter, is we feel like we have to win a certain way or look for a certain type. And, mm -hmm. I, and I've seen many guys that are grappling experts fall in love with striking and, and kind of even to their detriment don't when it's opportune time. So I was very happy to see you in that fight actually go back to your roots, showing that – you're not beholden to a certain way of winning. You're just you're out there to win fights, and and your ego was definitely put in check in that aspect. A lot of guys, you know, with their ego in there, they, they I gotta win by the knockout. I'm gonna show people. I'm gonna stand and bang, and it drives me nuts to see guys that are good at grappling. It's like, hey, you're right. Fights start on their feet, mm -hmm. but if you have an opportunity to win the fight, take the win. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like you took the words right out of my coach's mouth. I, I won't lie to you. We had that exact conversation 
from two fights ago, actually, when I fought Shaman. So um, he, he had that exact conversation with me. He's like, hey, I know they're building these highlights around you and telling you you're knocking everybody out, man, but show these people you can grapple. Show these people you can grapple. It didn't happen in that fight, but he's been repeating that same exact conversation no. ever since that Well, fight. I mean, if it's there, you're a talented athlete, and you are a good striker, but why stick to anything? You know, it makes no sense to me when I see guys hold on to something and go, well, I have to win like this. <clears throat> and I'm like, why? You know, like, well, it's exciting fights, fight of the night. And it's like people almost get more, you know, obsessed with their how they're going to do stuff more than just the substance of actually being successful. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously there's a fine line. I don't want to watch someone bear hook someone against the cage for 15 minutes. That sucks. But as far as winning techniques, submissions, you know, and takedowns with, with, with striking, do what it takes to win. Flow. That's what I mean. It's the essence of being a mixed martial artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also think, Sadiq, that, you know, from a matchmaker standpoint, I think maybe the best thing that a young fighter can have, especially when they're working their way up the ranks in terms of uh, uh, stylistic pedigree, is when matchmakers sit down and they talk about potential matchups and they get a, a, a guy or a lady's name on the table, and when you start talking about, well, how's this fight going to go? If the an honest answer is, I don't know, that's probably the best thing. You know, because predictability is, unless you're just trying to protect a guy, a lot of times isn't uh, very sellable. When there's mystery, when there's, look, yeah. he could knock him out, he could wrestle. I'll tell you another thing about this fight was it went to decision. And another thing about Sadiq's record is you it's feast or famine with Sadiq. You either knock people out in the first round or you go to decision, which is another nice thing because you can show you're not just uh, – we always talk about like the, the sports car, you know, that can go fast for a short period of time. But it's also nice to be able to show them uh, you can take somebody uh, the, the, the whole way, right? Yes. I've, I've been uh, – coming up here as Team Lord Irvin, I've been around a lot of um, – talented people and a lot of people who are because around here there's so many world-class grapplers you know and we've consistently made a lot of world champions and i've also been able to watch people who are world-class and are good enough to tap world-class guys but for some reason it just doesn't produce um the the championships like the world world championships but i've also seen the people who consistently get those world championships that weren't the best at the gym and what separated the two was just one of them knew how to win a competition mm -hmm. and that's one of the best things i took away from that you know not everybody's gonna be um the highlight real guy but if you learn how to win it's gonna solve a lot of your problems mm -hmm. <laughs> no matter how you do it mm -hmm. true now what's going on with these uh decorations in the background sadiq did you <laughs> it looks like you haven't taken your decorations down from uh your quinceanera what's what's going on back there <laughs> A ignore that please that was um it, it's it's been here for a while it was a, a birthday surprise like, hey happy birthday to my girlfriend you know uh -huh. like <laughs> when i decorated the room i just never took him down <laughs> okay well that's all right that's boy that's the romantic sadiq there we didn't know you had a soft side huh <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly what it was too. You know, I had the floor all blued out. That's her favorite color. Oh, you know, yeah. I had the blue lights and everything going on. But yeah, let, let's just ignore that. Now, was it a special occasion or just purely her birthday? Oh, right? Her birthday. Yeah, her birthday. Yeah, that's kind of smart though. When you think about it, you leave the decorations up because then it, later on, if she gets mad at you about something, you just be like looking up at the ceiling, going, "Oh boy, I haven't taken those decorations down from that romantic surprise." Oh yeah, I got to remember to do that. Huh? Yeah. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, all right. Well, let's see. Now, speak. All right. So, uh, what, Valentine's Day just passed. What'd you do for Valentine's Day, Sadiq? Uh, Valentine's. Hey, man, I, I got I got a pass on Valentine's Day. You know, um, because right after my fight, it was my first time ever going on vacation, and it was only because of my girl. You know, she was like, because um, I cut her off after a certain amount of time, um, close to fight time. You know, and uh -huh. and it sucks, but she's used to it by now because we've been together since I was an amateur, and she knows like. A, a certain amount of time, like, you're not going to see me or hear from me. Mm. So after the fight, she was like, "That we're not going to do anything. We're not going to do anything, you know, because I'm not used to making money. I just started making money now in the UFC. So I was like, man, you got to do something for me. So we went to, um, like, Universal Studios and stuff like that, and we had a lot of fun out there in Florida. Oh, and okay. we came back a couple of days before Valentine's Day. And she's like, oh, so what are you going to get me for Valentine's Day? I was like, man, you don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, Doing nothing, you know? Yeah, like, no, you 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 took care of her. 
I, I'm I'm in that boat. Jennifer's birthday is January 30th, so I get there's a corridor where I get hit with Christmas, her birthday, yeah. and Valentine's Day. And if you really want to get technical, our first date was on February 7th, which is also my mother's birthday. So there's a that I actually need like a little fun to build up for those couple of months of uh, spending. I'm kind of in that boat too. That's an interesting strategy where you do the listen. You know, when it gets close to fight time. You just won't hear from me. I'm gonna. Bet. I'm waiting for the fighter to try that, and then for his girl to find out that he retired like two years prior to whenever she thought he did. He just uses that as a way to get away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Around around that is not even. It's not only for me though, but it's also for her because um, I don't feel like I represent myself the best when it gets to that yeah. time. You know, there's a lot of stress going on. Mm-hmm. There's um, and you're preparing to go hurt somebody, you know, so it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm used to a nice mellow dude, you know, so, yeah. and, and you're hungry. That's the biggest thing. It's mm. like, it's the, it's the weight. So I, I'm real like antsy and stuff like that. I don't want to do that to them. You know, the only people that I feel like I, I still stay around, like maybe like my mother, I go visit her or go see my little brother. Cause those are the only people that I know, no matter what state I'm in, we could still stay in the Zen flow, but right. you know, men, you know, they they're quick to get on you, and I don't want to explode on her. Well, hey, your mom could be of some use. She can hold pads for you. If anybody follows Sadiq on his social media, his mom is she still working the the she's still hitting the pads. Yes, one hundred percent, man. Consistently, at her her two twice a week schedule, but she yeah. don't break it. That's okay. Yeah, it's always fun to see her on there working out, hitting the. Uh, Hitting the pads and everything. All right. Well, that's cool. Well, that sounds uh, that sounds great. So, of course, the proverbial question: What's next? Did they talk to you about anything? You got any uh, idea? I don't know, man. As far as I know, honestly, throughout my whole career, it's always been like this. I've never been the chasing a fight kind of guy a lot of people you wouldn't believe it but most of the time i'll just be sitting around like this and my coach would just call me like hey all right we're fighting this guy next and i was like all right that's and that's kind of how my career has been you know but now that i have a number i'm probably gonna have to start making some shout outs pretty soon but i haven't Mm -hmm. heard anything for now all right very good all right now the other thing is sadiq has uh another reason to celebrate he is a newly minted united states citizen frank so congratulations sadiq welcome (laughs) Welcome. Thank you, thank you, man. I'm, I'm, I'm a. Uh, um, it was funny when we was getting the citizenship stuff done. I, I got it before my brother and my mom, and that, they had to like sit around for like ten minutes, and I'm just sitting there like, man, look at you, man, get out of my country. <laughs> like just, just making the stereotypical jokes, you know. It was yeah. like, man, you guys are just here to take our jobs, get out of my country, you know. But, but it's funny. Long, hat, long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, you like the twin that's born first. Yeah. You know, like you can always talk about being the older one. Well, tell everybody, uh, give everybody an idea since you just went through this process. Frank and I were talking not too long ago, I yeah. think, about what a difficult process this is. Extremely and I, I know just from talking to you personally, yeah. Sadiq, seems like over maybe the last couple of years now it's been. Uh, oh, no, that's, that's how long you guys have known me. Don't yeah. forget, I came here initially when I was nine years old. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been it's been a struggle, you know. A lot of people don't know even even getting to the point where you could even apply for it is a is a struggle, you know, cuz yeah. you got to somehow make a living without having the right kind of papers or the right kind of documents. So, it's just it's it's a long complicated process. I don't think it's something to actually talk about on the podcast. It's just yeah. <laughs> just no, it's complicated. Yeah. Now, now that you've become a citizen and you see how difficult it really is and how, honestly, we do need some kind of reform for our immigration process for to citizenship, would you feel taken back if the next generation of, of applicants had it easier, streamlined, and, and more proficient? Would you feel like that cheapens what you did, or would you just be happy that, well, I'm just glad they don't have to suffer like I had to suffer? Yeah, yeah. Nah, that, I'll, I'll be a lot happier for them, you know, because... No matter what, I can't, like, me and my brother had this, like, ongoing joke where it was like, man, I feel like if I had powers and I could, like, travel back in time or something, I probably would never use it because there was nothing we could have done different, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, if, back in those situations, we were literally stuck at where we was, you know? And the best we could have done is just keep our nose clean, stay out of trouble, and just wait for the opportunity to present itself. So if, if they could... It, 
if they could make that process a lot easier for the next generation, man, it's, it's a, it'll be a blessing to those folks, you know, because most of them are like me. I don't know much about, like, the drug dealers or any other people that they talk about on the media. I just know about the immigrants like us, that is people that are coming here for a better situation. Uh, I know, I, I guess I love my country, I love Nigeria, but back home is like there was a cap on how high you could go based on where you was born you know based on like what class you're born into or like the environment around you but in this country is the exact opposite it's like it's harder for the people that are born here to see that but the people that come here from somewhere else coming over here is like a damn gold mine you know it's like the opportunities here are crazy are you uh, registered to vote yes sir as soon yeah. as, as, soon as we got to, as soon as we got citizenship, we have to be able to vote. Are you excited? Are you ex- you're about to get to vote? Are you excited? Yeah, it's it's more for like the little things that are happening around me. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie and say like I've been um doing a lot of research on it or anything like that, but it's 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 good to be able to at least have some kind of impact before I'm you just you, around and let everything yes, happen around you. I there is nothing. I just voted today because we had our uh, early voting for Nevada primary. You're in Maryland, so uh, Maryland will be coming up. But but it, I'm telling you, the feeling. I don't care who you vote for. I'm just saying the act of voting to me. And this has been the case since I was 18 years old. As you know, Frank, I'm a lifelong teetotaler. I have never tasted alcohol. So turning 21 was no big deal to me. But turning 18, that was a big deal because I voted. And uh, just being there today and seeing all the people lined up and all the people working the process, oh, I love it. I love the feeling. It just makes me feel powerful. I love voting. And I went and voted today. So I'll, I'll uh, be anxious to hear about your first voting experience. What were you going to say? You were about to say something, Frank. I forgot. Oh. <laughs> um, all right, Sadiq. Now, I want to ask you this because you had to do – uh, when you get ready to be a U.S. citizen, you have to do the uh, like uh, the citizenship test and everything, right? Yes. All right. Yes. Now I have not. I did not tee you up ahead of time on this, oh, but I yeah, want. Yeah. I want to oh see. My goodness. Now here's the thing. <laughs> Before you go any further, as soon as as soon as we finished taking that test, I specifically told my brother and my mom, I said, I'm erasing every single one of these me- one of these questions from my mind because I'm never going to have to deal with this again. Well, wait a minute now. Now, here's the thing. This is a lot of people, a lot of UFC fighters would consider this a dream matchup because I'm not just going to put you on the spot. Now, now, you will, even if he doesn't retire in the next few years, uh, fighting at heavyweight, Frank is far too heavy for you to ever match up against. So I don't think we have to worry about that. But Frank, and feel free, you can decline this fight offer, okay? Because I'm putting you on the spot. But I was wondering if I could just throw out a few questions and maybe have you oh, no. okay. compare with uh, newly minted U.S. citizen Sadiq Yusuf. Would you be willing to do that, Frank? I will. All right, did you ever in your wildest dreams, Sadiq, think you would be matching up with UFC legend Frank Mir? Definitely not, and definitely not for our citizenship questions. <laughs> okay, all right. I hope I represent the uh, natural-born <laughs> citizens well. <laughs> all right, so let's do this. Uh, I, I have an idea. Let's we'll do it game show style. I'm going to throw out a question. Let's go one, two. Let's go best of three. I'm going to give you three, and let's have. If you feel like you know the answer. Just buzz in with your name. Okay. So let me hear Frank or Sadiq. So I'll, I'll give the question, and then whoever wants to answer first, and then if it's wrong, next person will have a chance to steal. All right. <clears throat> question number one. How often are senators elected? Frank. Sadiq. Okay, Frank goes. Well, I heard Frank first. We Every might six years. All right. There you go. That's, that's Frank's Frank, question. Yeah. Uh, did, now, be honest. Did you know that, Sadiq? Yeah, yeah. You know that one? Okay, that's good. That's a pretty easy one. Um, I think how we should do this fairly. Should I give Sadiq yeah, the give next Sadiq, question? Yeah. yeah. And then that way yes. we'll maybe possibly be one and one. Okay. Uh, Sadiq's good first crack at it. Yeah. Sadiq, what are the first ten amendments to the Constitution called? The Bill of Rights. Yeah, ding, ding, ding. Well done, well done. <laughs> All right, here is your uh, tiebreaker question, I guess. All right. Um, all right. So are they buzzing in on this one? Yeah, we'll okay. buzz in on this right. one. Okay. Uh, who is third in line for the presidency? Sadiq. Sadiq. The Speaker of the House. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh. Got me. Did you, would you have known it? 
I knew it, but not fast enough. Yeah. I had to think about it. I was still in thought. I'm like, <laughs> Sadiq, I am impressed. Congratulations, sir. That's that's a fine representation of a newly minted U.S. citizen, I would say, right there. All right. Well done, sir. We don't have a belt to strap around your waist, but uh, uh, we'll send you a phone booth fighting T-shirt or something like that. Yeah. Yes, sir. That was fun. I'm not going to lie. That was fun. Yeah, that's impressive. That was very good. Yeah. yeah, it was good. All right. Well, listen, man, What? Uh, so so what do you do uh, in the – I mean, uh, not off seat because you want to stay ready for a fight and all that kind of stuff, but uh, I assume you're, 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 you're training, you're staying sharp, all that kind of stuff in case you get the short notice call. Yeah, I don't um I don't really have a trainer camp. Believe it or not, the only thing that changes when I have a fight will be um like rest time. My mm-hmm. coach will schedule rest time for me. Um so it's not just practice won't be like a sporadic and the specific training partners. Outside of that, everything else is basically the same. I'm I train all year round. Okay. All right, good. How's our buddy James James Vick? Have you you seen him recently? Yeah, yeah, he's doing okay. I talk to him every once in a while. Um mm-hmm. But he's still back in Texas. The last time I talked to him was um last week because I'm doing this little thing with Tim Grover. So he just wanted to know how that was. Mm-hmm. But um, he's, he's okay. I haven't talked to him this week. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I like to believe that when he's not in camp, he goes and lives in the woods somewhere back in the, <laughs> the sticks of Texas. Yeah, yeah. All right, very nice. Will you tell him hi if you talk to him? And then you come back on with us when, uh, well, anytime really, but definitely keep us posted. If you get a word on a fight or something like that, come back on with us. Yes, sir. I'm always happy to be on. All right, and the other thing is Frank is very competitive, so he's probably, rematch, I've seen him do this, yeah. he'll go home and study, and then he'll want a rematch. So uh, one of the problems about holding a victory over Frank Mir is you got to give him the opportunity for a rematch at Everybody some point. Everybody wants some rematch. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'm, re- I'm ready for the challenge right now, man. I never thought I'd have to answer those questions again. I, my heart was kind of racing a little bit, but I was like, oh, yeah, I had it. Very nice. All right, buddy. Well, thanks. It's good talking to you. We'll talk to you again soon, okay? Have a nice one, y'all. Super Sadiq Yusuf catching us up on uh, what's going on in the world of an up-and-coming uh, UFC fighter and a newly minted U.S. citizen. I'm not kidding, man. I get very – this is a, a real day of patriotism for me. I get excited to go vote, and uh, I never that feeling has never left me ever since I was 18 years old. I just love the feeling of the power and all the votes are – I, uh, you know, everybody's vote counts just as much as everybody else's. That's the idea anyway. That's the uh, integrity of the process we have to protect. Now, um, since everybody's taught, even if you're uh, not uh, local here in Las Vegas or anywhere in Nevada like Frank and I are, or Mikey, um, everybody's talking about Nevada because we have a caucus system. And there's only a few states anymore that have caucus systems. I was the first. That was a big disaster uh, a couple of weeks ago, and now everybody's wondering still how Nevada's going to run. Okay, so and I've tried to read up on yeah. it and sit there and go, well, I'm confused. Here's, here's the nutshell version. They were using an app. Right. Okay, that's the first problem. And we were supposed to have that app here. We right? were. And when Iowa happened, we abandoned the oh, app. That but sucks. Here's what happens when you go to vote. Um, most of the time, you're almost all of the time, you're going to be greeted by three or four very elderly people that are helping you in the process, the, regardless of your Democrat, Republican, whatever. Old people, that's who has a whole day to volunteer to be precinct captains for the day. You get paid a little something, but it's basically a volunteer job. Um, I did it. I've done it a number of times. Really? And the, yeah, I did it. I was an election judge when I was 20 years old, I think. Man, you were so involved in this process. It, 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 it's incredible to see because if you've never really seen and, – and that's why when people are like, oh, nobody knows what they're doing, I, I've got a lot more sympathy for that because these are people who – they're not this isn't their job they're not trained professionals other than just like a quick okay we got 15 minutes here's how everything's going to go okay here's your box now go try to help all these people and let me tell you something when you think about dealing with the general public and people sometimes that are like holy cow does this person have two brain cells to rub together wait till you see some of the people you get in line to vote so uh so now that technology is what it is the idea is that in iowa they were going to use an app the app had all kinds of big problems so like frank you just said they scrapped the app idea 
here in Nevada. I was but, so looking forward to the app idea. Yeah, well, <laughs> they still had the caucus system. You were never going to be able to vote on the app, but it was going to be an app that the actual people at the voting locations used to log you in. But it right? was going to speed the whole process up, right? In theory. In theory, it was. Yeah, until Iowa happened. So, so uh, no pull-out chairs sitting in line for three hours. Yeah. So today, the way uh, the way that it worked, we got. I went uh, at uh, seven thirty this morning. The polling place didn't open until eight, but I got in line, and um, uh, it took me took me about an hour. Um, but it wasn't too bad. Yeah, it's not bad. Right? But it the way it works now is so you get um, when it comes your turn, the the polling place worker has an iPad. They look you up on there as the registered voter. So they're using the tablet to log you in as present and, and you're about to vote. The actual vote that you do is on a paper ballot. Now, what's interesting about this is they're trying something where in the past, do you know the, do you know like all the differences between primaries and caucuses? Well, the caucus is how you pick a delegate, right, to choose. Yeah, so so like, so like what it is is, like, most states just have the primaries where it's like, okay, there's 10, however many people running for president. I pick one. That's my vote. I'm done. Basically right. like a little mini election. Yeah. Yeah. The it's caucus. More of a direct democracy type yeah. thought the, yeah. the caucus, and I did this four years ago uh, in 2016, uh, is you, after you vote, you come back to your polling place. And so, like, say I voted 2016, I voted for Bernie Sanders, but there's a bunch of Hillary people there, too, right? So now, because I came back, I am volunteering as a Bernie delegate. There's other people in this room. There's some Hillary delegates. And you actually divide up the room, and each person represents a certain number of votes. So, you know, let's say... Uh, Mikey's for the other person. He's going to move over to the other side of the room. I'm on my side of the room. Now, where it gets tricky is, let's say there's a third candidate in, a, in there that didn't get 15%, I believe is the cutoff, uh, to, they call it a threshold, the 15% threshold. Mm-hmm. So let's say Frank was for well, like, and, uh, like Andrew, Andrew Yang. Yang. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. That's a good example. So and now, now my guy's got to choose which side they you, want to jump yeah, on. Yeah, we right? need you to come join one of us because we're are both. Are we going to go Bernie? Are we going to go, yeah, you know, exactly. a moderate? We're, we're one in two people, and we want to recruit you to come over. So that's the way the actual caucus will work on Saturday. But they're trying something different where if you did early voting like I did today, you have to pick your top three. And, okay, I was mm. hearing this on the news. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Man. Yeah, so... so you're explaining it, and it kind of lost me mm-hmm. because I'm driving, I'm listening, mm-hmm. I'm like, wait a minute, what? So then, like, yeah. this person to get in, so it goes to your second... Uh, here, go ahead. So so I'll give you an example. I'm so, explaining that I don't right. understand. So <laughs> so on the paper ballot, you can, uh, you can pick up to five people, okay. but you have to pick three. So what it'll show you is columns one through five, and it'll have each candidate listed. So I like I I mean spoiler alert I voted for Bernie Sanders so <gasps> my yeah let <laughs> me pick Mikey up off the floor yeah. so my uh so you know I bubble in him in my first column but then in my and it, mine is not gonna match because he if he doesn't win it he's definitely gonna be top two finisher probably so it's not like he's not gonna break the fifteen percent threshold so right. this. Th- for practical purposes, my ballot isn't even going to factor into this, but let's just say it did. If by some chance he did not get that 15%, then they'll go look at my ballot and they'll go, okay, who is that person's number two? Then they'll put mine over in that number two stack if that person okay. got the 15%, right? And they just keep going down the line until they find someone that you got that got the 15%. A much more organized way than we've done it in the past then. that seems right. like it makes sense yeah yeah the caucus of, uh, the other way of just trying to recruit guys over okay well you know like i like that i think i like that idea better to be honest it, with you. it in a, i think in a perfect world it's not a bad idea because yeah. i don't just have an opinion about for me it's not bernie sanders or nobody i still would like to have a say hey if my guy or lady isn't the top person uh-huh. i'd still like to weigh in on who I want the second person to be. And up to now, the only way you could have participated in that process was to go on the actual election day and go back to the caucus and stick around. This is a way that you can do it by still voting early, but, but do it. 
the problem is, and I don't, I don't know that the that whole app situation and all that is even necessarily unique to the caucus so much as it just is technology in general. And you're dealing with, you know, I mean, not to be ageist, but I mean, you know, everybody knows as you get older. You know, everybody's going to have that one piece of technology. Boy, that's when you know Death's pregame show has started, right? When there's that one thing that you can't. I remember when I used to have to go over and pro- program my grandma's VCR. Like, yeah. that was the one that just, you you know, it's games passed you by. So, basically, what happened in Iowa was you had a bunch of people in the their, their later stage of their life who probably don't even have an iPad at home trying to run one. Yes, and I don't know what all was going on with that app. I mean, that's another thing, too, is you just don't know. Yeah, I was hearing that it wasn't firing up. Yeah, that was, I mean, and, and listen, I'm saying it's old people. It's mostly old people. That doesn't mean that there's not some other, you know, it, you don't have to be a senior citizen to be able to volunteer. So that's not everybody. But the fact that it was so widespread, whatever was happening in Iowa, I think they were having real problems with that app. The thing I kept seeing over and over again was people just saying, hey, I'm trying to log into this app to record votes, and it's just not taking it. Mm-hmm. And see, that's the, that's, the, that's the part of it that you really have to have integrity for because someone is in charge of deli- – delete. like when I put that ballot – I put that ballot in a in a, a paper like a cardboard file box today that had a slot cut in it. I mean, you can't get any more old school analog than that. I mean, right. I just took a piece of paper and I dropped it in a cardboard box. And that person, somebody at the end of the day, has to put that box in their car and drive it somewhere to the you know the the central uh office i mean when i was an election judge i had to take a giant we had this it was one of those machines that you feed the scantron looking thing mm-hmm. into and the voting machine had this big metal box it looked like a like an ammunition box but like a giant metal box and i put that thing on the seat of my 88 firebird and drove it down to the courthouse but it's like as a you know, 20 year old, I think at the time I was responsible for that. I mean, that yeah. had thousands of votes in it. And what happened if I just threw it out the window? I mean, that's, you know, you know, my thought on this, as far as like all the technology and people are like, no, it has to say paper and all this. I'm like, look, we do global entry mm-hmm. you know, right now. You can get into the U S you have your passport, you go up to the machine, you, 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 you scan it. It takes a picture of you. It confirms mm-hmm. who you are information and you go, uh, if they just had machines like that and had people set up, I mean, obviously not everybody has access to a passport or IDs, mm-hmm. and, and, I, and, I, you know, and I hear arguments going for that, but for individuals like me that don't want to sit for two or three hours or I just want to walk up to a, basically an ATM machine that's there 24 hours at night and I, for the three days of early voting, go, okay, I can walk up, mm-hmm. scan my ID, it takes a picture, pump in my social security number, it confirms my identity, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If there's a dispute now, I can go back and go, okay, well, this was the picture of the guy mm-hmm. who put his name down as Francisco Mir, and if it you know, doesn't look anything like me, well, now we can call into question. But, I mean, you can walk into, through, into the country with that level of technology, we trust it, but then we we're not going to trust it with voting. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I think well, part of it is they've got to put the money behind it. And there's because like the primaries are paid for or the uh, caucuses rather are paid for by the Democratic Party. Like this is not a state funded thing. So I agree. It's cut to me. It's kind of like teacher salaries. Like the more you pay, the better teacher you're going to get. And it's not a sexy thing to pay for. It's not when we sit around talking about approving increases in property taxes. Is there a stat like that? Show anybody gets excited person for about person. And I know because of our mm-hmm. uh, the electoral college that it doesn't really boil down to that. But I dare say there's more Democrats in the U.S. U.S. has always been more liberal leaning than, than conservative, right? I as mean, far as general population. Uh, it's tough to say. I the thing about the, I mean, everything is always so close to fifty fifty. I mean, both sides will claim that you know a lot. Of, what they'll do here's the classic line. Well, America has always been a. The conservative will say center right country, and the liberal will say center left country. Yeah. But yeah. it's. It's, uh, I, I think it's reasonably close either way. You're competing for, here's what you're competing for. You have, uh, like, I know what my politics are. 
I know what my it doesn't matter who the person is that's running I'm matching my political philosophy to the available candidate but there's a lot of people who like have you heard people have you heard talk about the people that voted for Barack Obama and then voted for Donald Trump like there's a good chunk of people who did that yeah that makes no sense I was you know it's so funny Either way, even I if you went the other way, it doesn't was make any sense. On, uh, in the POTUS a couple of weeks ago, and they were bringing up that there were people that did mm-hmm. that. And uh, again, you know, when you're driving, it doesn't have my full attention because you know I'm driving mm-hmm. a vehicle. I remember kind of sitting there, go, "What did they just say?" And, mm-hmm. and, I, and I was trying to hit the mm-hmm. replay because it's on, you know, Sirius to to mm-hmm. to rehear it, to uh, to see if I heard what I thought I heard. Mm-hmm. And I was like, "There's no way that there's somebody who voted for Obama." Mm-hmm. Then voted for Trump. I mean, I'll tell you who the people are. There are people. There are people that did that. There, yes, there are people who gravitate toward identity politics. So there are people who like the person. So and listen, I saw this. I voted for Barack Obama twice, but I saw this in people that turned out to vote for him, and it was great to have a lot more younger people than normally vote and he definitely had that a lot of times the youth vote doesn't turn out they turned out for him but i also saw a bunch of people who kind of thought he was a rock star you know and they didn't they couldn't really give you good reasons why they were voting for him that's the prop so what happens is now that he so he he runs twice he can't be elected again those people didn't turn out for hillary clinton they were drawn not to the politics but to the person so they were drawn to obama really is same, popularity yeah against. and wow. same thing happens with trump because what's the thing you hear about trump from the person who can't explain their political positions like he talks like me we shook it up he's Tells it like it is, like these sort of platitudes that don't really mean anything, but they're drawn to that personality. That's actually why I keep hating the argument <laughs> that I keep hearing. Uh-huh. People are like, oh, well, we need a, a moderate to run against Trump because... Mm-hmm. Bernie would be is too far left mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and, and all your people in the middle are going to feel left out and not vote. And I'm like, ah, really? Trump already beat a moderate. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's mm-hmm. Hillary Clinton was a moderate, right? I mean, she's about as moderate yes. of a liberal or a, yes, a, she is. a Democrat as you can yes, get. Yes, she, she got is. smashed. Yes. Uh, and then people go, oh, she had baggage. I'm like, every candidate has baggage. Mm-hmm. I'm hearing Bernie Sanders about the third house he bought, different money about with, with the, the college. His wife's came. college. Yeah. Like ran a college I mean, in the ground or something. Uh, everybody. If you dig deep enough, oh, has what, it. What, his wife ran a college into the ground. Or she mismanaged like college money or yeah, something. like yeah. five hundred thousand was missing, and all of a sudden, like he gets a third house, and they're uh-huh. you know they're going. Anyways, you yeah. know, this, uh, obviously it's not to the level of the Benghazi mm. situation. But that being said, when people say that, I said no, I, I honestly feel that Bernie is exactly what beats Trump because Trump has a core of fanatics. Mm-hmm behind him that is like no matter what he does you know he can do no wrong um, and, and then you have bernie sanders who has the same you know devotion because look man that guy he's the same dude since the 1960s getting arrested in civil yes. rights movements as he yes. is today to the point where somebody like me who's kind of in the middle i'm like well i mean you haven't changed any of your ideas like you don't think maybe this might work better here or there you know mm-hmm. whatever the case may be but then you still have that same core of, of, of people that are going to, you know, and I think that's what's needed. Uh, I guess the best analogy I can use, you know, it takes fire to fight fire. You know? mm-hmm. It is, yeah, it, it, it was a tough, well, it wasn't a tough call for me. I voted my, my conscience and my politics. But I will tell you, on the left side of the political spectrum, that is a debate that is being had, and it's a debate that existed four years ago. Yeah. In in 2016, when it was basically down to Hillary and Bernie, I had this conversation with my aunt, who has worked in politics her entire, she's worked on Capitol Hill her entire life. And she is, she's an old school hippie and protested at the 68 Democratic Convention in Chicago. I mean, all that kind of, you know, like summer of love kind of stuff. And when I'll take you back even further than that. When Obama ran against Hillary in the primary in uh, 2008, right, everybody thought that was going to come down to black versus white, right, male versus female. You know what it came down to? Young versus old. 
old Democrats backed Hillary Clinton, younger Democrats backed Barack Obama. And that was, even though she and I agree politically that we were on different sides of that. She was a Clinton Which, supporter, I was an Obama supporter. You'd think that everybody that's everybody who's the uh, never Trumper types mm-hmm. that no matter what he can't do any well you mm-hmm. know uh, uh, which I think that's not their outlook too because there are some things that are going really well mm-hmm. you know just obviously uh, you know <laughs> his Twitter accounts not one of them mm-hmm. but anyways um, Bernie has the biggest backing of the youth yes. correct yes I mean as far as college level, uh, college-aged voters and minorities. Yeah, they're all out for Bernie. Yes, you know. Yes, no, and 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 this. So so I, I brought up or the Obama. Population-wise, there's more than there are the right. older people. So I, I brought up the Obama Hillary thing because that that's where I saw it first, and then in 2016, it was exactly what you're talking about frank which was the moderate establishment right and you say moderate listen hillary's to the right of obama especially on uh like um, military stuff like she's she's a hawk when it comes to to military so um at least that's what her voting record was so so when it was hillary against bernie that same argument was getting made now i'll take you back to this you know conversation i have with my aunt now who's pushing she's probably almost 70 now but she and i would talk and she knew my vote was important because i lived in nevada right so she lives in texas it's whatever but but uh it was going to be important in nevada and she's like listen you know i like bernie but they're gonna they're gonna hit him with the socialist stuff and you got to go with you know a, a moderate and someone that's gonna appeal to everybody and i didn't i still supported Bernie in uh, 2016, but I've been a supporter of his for a very long time. But it was that's the it was the exact same situation. It was like, are you going to vote your conscience? Are you going to try to play this game of like hedging your bets? And well, I'm going to go with the person I think can win. Listen, I heard it talked about in line today. And honestly, I try to you, 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 me and my big mouth. You'd think I would be all about it, but actually. I really respect the process. I don't like yeah, I think the idea. You're not supposed to. You're like, not really supposed yeah. to. What you're not supposed to do is a lot. You campaign. Yeah. Right. So like, you definitely can't wear campaign buttons. So you can't really stop old grandma from. You know, can you believe who's? I mean, somebody's going to say something like that. But I personally just kind of respect the process. Mm-hmm. And know, even though I know we're all voting Democrat in that in that caucus, I don't really. Anyway, but I was hearing that. And I was like, the guy in front of me was voting for Amy Klobuchar. And he was saying to the other person talking to him, you know, I just, I, I wish I could vote my politics, meaning he was more liberal than Klobuchar. But he's like, you know, but we got to have somebody who can win and she can carry the Midwest. Yeah, I think that's and, a losing mentality. Again. It is. It yeah. is. And that Especially is, when it's already gone that way. Yeah. Like, you know, that old adage of the, you know, the definition of insanity is repeating mm-hmm. the same process, mm-hmm. right? And expecting different results. Like going for a moderate didn't work the first time because mm-hmm. there is just there is a, a stardom that Trump has that that has that following mm-hmm. that I, I don't think unless you have somebody on the other side that's the complete opposite that also draws that kind of fan fervor, you know, just look at I mean Bernie the guy has generated the most money. And the guy doesn't get any big donors. No, you know it's I mean? it's small donors. It's grassroots donors. That just donors. shows you the numbers behind them. And I personally think that a lot of that pick a moderate, pick a moderate, I think that's coming from the Republican side because mm-hmm. they're trying to prop up an easier target for Trump. Mm-hmm. I know people keep saying, oh, Trump will destroy Bernie. I'm all, I don't think so, guys. Trump, you know, in 2016 wasn't the greatest – on the debate floor, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like he had to change the topic a lot. He was very animated. Would it, 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 it make more, you know, uh, YouTube or you know, viral clips from his just you know, you know, not most intelligent statements, but just you know the f- faces he makes. Um, how do you go to battle with Bernie on on policies up there? You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. just going. I just, I, I just, I think that. And again, uh, I'm a registered independent, so I'm in the middle here. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, um, 
I think that that's just, I think that if I had to pick somebody that go, against, if I was for Trump, the last guy I'd want him to go against is Bernie. And if I was for Bernie, a hundred percent, I would be picking him like, yeah, this is, this is going to be a, a, yeah. a good battle. I don't think a Buttigieg or a close off is really a good pick. You know? Well, I definitely don't think Buttigieg, look, the guy had great Iowa, great New Hampshire, but those people are, are, are a little bit more open-minded and understanding of his uh, uh, his uh, uh, personal life. Mm -hmm. <sighs> He's going to get murdered in more conservative states. Like there's not you know, only more conservative states. You want to hear me say something aloud that a lot of people won't say, particularly liberals, when it comes to Pete Buttigieg and his electability problems. Black people, a lot of times are very conservative when it comes to homosexuality. That's a problem. It is in the churches. It is as much as uh, black churches were a part of... Does this feel weird? Because normally I'm trying to reel you back from saying something like, no, 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 wait, we may have to... Say no, but I. this is... Yeah. I'm just being honest with you. As much as black churches have been important in terms of like civil rights movement, things like that, they are not across the board well, up to speed where everybody uh, else is. And I agree on with you 100 percent. Live and let live. I think where that even stuff more is concerned. of a scientific approach of how I think about it is that your white Democrat uh, uh, is not very religious on average. Mm -hmm. I, I, if you're going to have atheists on either yeah. side, they're going to be more of them are going to be Caucasian and liberals. I agree. Right? Whereas if you're going to have a Democrat who is a evangelical or a Baptist, you know, you know, a Christian, mm -hmm. uh, they're people of color. Yeah, on Hispanics, the Democratic Catholic. Side. Hispanics, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, I mean, it's not just the black vote, but I'll tell you because my father's Cuban. Mm -hmm. I come from a Latin, you know, uh, family. Mm -hmm. um, it's not very well condoned there either because of how mm -hmm. strong Catholicism is in the Latin community. Um, you know, uh, it, it's more accepted now than it ever has been. Yeah. But it's definitely nowhere near as mainstream as it is amongst, you know, well, let's put it the, in my family, the Cuban side, uh, my, if I were to come out gay, would have a much more difficult time dealing with it than the white side of my family, who's mm -hmm. just more like, well, everybody just loves each other and just it is what it is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, and I'm biracial, so I get to see both sides of it. I know which side would, you know, like, you know, my, my, my great aunt, would we would never tell her. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. you just could not tell her yeah. if I was gay. You know what I mean? Like, let's just not even, let, let's just, look, she's old enough that pretty soon she's not going to be here. Just, you know, yeah. <laughs> Bring your girlfriend and just pretend that's her and just. <laughs> yep. Yep. No. And and so now I'll tell you this: as somebody who had no idea who uh, Pete Buttigieg was before, and that's, I mean, I'm I pay attention, and he came out of nowhere. I will tell you this: the guy is super impressive. He has a great political future ahead of him. He wasn't my top pick for this time around, but that guy is going places, and he should. He should. He is more moderate than I prefer, but in terms of uh, somebody you want to talk about that could in the future be a dynamic candidate, it's probably him. But but um, for something, you know, it, for something, I mean, my personal favorite was Yang. Yes, I well, really feel guy. that Andrew Yang is just ahead of his time. An listen, another guy. I think that in twenty years yeah. from now, that's the guy that everybody that I think his uh, stance and approach. I mean, look, he was an intelligent businessman. Who just used numbers, you know, mm -hmm. it was math, you know, like you said, like, and, and for somebody such as myself, I just, I mean, look, you put up a pie chart or a graph and go, look, this is going to affect this and this is why. You got me sold. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, I don't want to hear emotions. I don't want to hear this is how we used to do it. And my grandfather's time was good enough for them. Like, no. Mm -hmm. T show me the stats. You know, well, so, I, I, I'm a percentage guy, you know? I agree that he really showed something. I mean, you know, I've, I've, my stance, as I've stated previously, is I don't think anybody should ever be elected president with no political or military experience. And really, if it's going to be somebody like Eisenhower that just came from, I mean, you're going to need to show me a four-star, five-star general. Like, just because if you have been elected, even at the municipal level, 
you understand what the vetting process is like, what the reporting process is like, how you avoid conflicts of interest, how you avoid violating anything from a campaign finance law to uh, you know federal regulations when it comes to I don't being- know. I think I just now, and I don't, I don't think I've ever really had this thought mm-hmm. before, but <laughs> I don't think you could be president if you weren't in the military. I, I don't know. Oh, I, we've I, had plenty of those. But I'm just saying that I... You would you would eliminate some of the greatest presidents the United States ever had. Yeah, but or would they have joined the military if that was the requirements that they had to have followed? Like, what if they'd have been drafted in? I, yeah. I know, like Maybe, if it was but, like you have to be thirty five, you have to have military experience. Would right. they have at eighteen, nineteen, like had the foresight to join yes. the military? You know, uh, I'm guaranteed you, JFK. His family grooming him to be. Well, he was in the military. Oh, JFK. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. Sorry, he was a hero. Let me think of another analogy. That's right. PT one oh nine. Thomas Jefferson. That's a guy that wasn't in the military, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, really? Mm -mm. Thomas Jefferson didn't partake in any of the... uh... Mm -mm. In fact, this list will surprise you. Hang on a second, I'll pull it up for you. That blows my mind. i got to be honest with you. you Yeah, I assumed that. I thought he was. I just made the assumption that, hey, the first three of them were all part of the the Adams and stuff. They weren't in the military. Oh, he was in the militia. He was a colonel in the militia. Yeah, I guess that's a little that's kind of a Yeah. Yeah. Um hang on a second though. Let me pull up I'm sure the military records from the 1700s but I mean, weren't I, the best. I, I, too. I don't know. But no, I, well, I really but you would have known. Right. Yeah, I'm saying yeah. This I mean, will this generals list, in the military yeah. by the time they're a general, they've ran a government. I mean, they've ran. I, yeah. mean, I mean, you think about it. Like they're dealing with people, they have to provide the infrastructure. Mm-hmm. I, they look the little bit of military understanding I have, being a general is extraordinarily political. Uh, and and, and the, the side of it, like, I feel like they would have a better grasp of war. And and I wouldn't maybe call into question somebody. Well, here you go. Here you go. Let me, let me hit you okay. with this real quick, okay? Uh, I was close on Thomas Jefferson. Uh, okay, this goes back to, so at this point, this list is a few years old, so it, it counted 43 uh, president. So that doesn't include Obama or Trump, but we know both of them were not in the military. So you can add them to the list. Okay, of the 43 men who have served as uh, president, uh, 31 served in the military. Um, and then it goes on to say, like like uh, Mikey just said, you know, um, uh, Jefferson was in the militia, others were uh, in reserves, things like that. But there are 12. John Adams wasn't. Yeah, 12 who did not serve in the military. John Adams, John Quincy Adams, Martin Van Buren, Grover Cleveland, uh, William H. Taft, Woodrow Wilson, Warren Harding, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, FDR, Bill Clinton, Obama. Hmm. So it's there's a number of them that, uh, that didn't. But I agree that it if... If you're not, here's what I'm saying on my position. If you're going to come in and say, I've never held office and I want to be president of the United States, you really better show me something in terms of military service. And that's why I brought up uh, Eisenhower. Like someone where you could go, okay, I was in the military, but I'm a four-star, five-star general, something like that. But short of that, that's not the place for you to start if if, if you're asking me to vote for you. you. So, but that's okay. Because people like Yang, people like uh, Buttigieg, to me, they they have bright political futures ahead of them if they want to continue. Go run for the Senate. Go run for Congress. Yeah, you know? people talk about Just give me a term or two, and then we'll take another another look at you. But um, I thought Buttigieg was a mayor or something, wasn't he? Yeah, he was yeah. a mayor. Oh, okay. And that's why I'm, I'm saying, um, even on the mayoral level, even though he – that's – not the kind of experience I'm You're looking for if your president. <laughs> no, no, I'll tell you this. It's still something. As a former mayoral candidate myself for a city that is the size of the city that he was the mayor of, I can tell you that going through the process of running for mayor for or Texas, I learned so much in terms of the paperwork that you have to fill out. you got to show your financial disclosure. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. So that if you got any hanky-panky going on, it's going to come to light. And that's why I'm just a big fan of that because I feel like, you know what, even if you're not completely on the up and up, you've at least been put through the ringer enough that if there's any obvious, like, you're going to, 
you're going to know a bunch of pitfalls to avoid by the time you get in the office just from holding any other elected office before. As I have said for years now, almost four, the one thing I always felt certain about with Trump, I was never on record as saying, hey, there was Russian collusion. I've seen enough proof for that. I was never on record as saying, you know, some of these things are facts. We're looking at them, but I'm, I wasn't jumping to conclusions. But the thing I always felt comfortable with saying is I'll bet you he had obstructed justice six ways to Sunday within the first three months of his presidency before anybody realized what was happening. And the reason was because he was used to running a private business that wasn't even publicly owned. So I'll bet what happened was, by the time anybody realized what was happening, because he was also surrounding himself, not like Bush 43 did, with a bunch of other people who had you know, been in uh, uh, the executive branch going back to the Ford administration. I'll bet you a bunch of those neophytes looked up and were like, wait, what'd you do? And he's like, well, I, I don't know. We wanted to get rid of the guy, so we, I told so-and-so to come up with a reason to fire him. And they're like, you can't do that. What do you mean I can't do that? That's the way we deal with it at Trump Tower, you know. And so for those, to me, those are practical reasons to elect someone who's been through. Because serving in public office is very different from owning a business. And when you go, well, we need to have somebody that, you know, Knows how to run a business. Run the country like you run a business. Business. The country is not a, a for-profit entity. It's not set up that way. It's a non-profit. And so the whole idea of if you're just used to being the master of your domain over there at Frank Mir Enterprises, believe it or not, even if it's a super successful business, that's actually not very relatable to how it's going to be if you're the president. Yeah. Were you going to say something, Mike? I thought you were about to say something. No. Oh, okay. No, right. um, but uh, yeah, so so that was yeah, non political stuff to talk about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, so anyway, but just to that philosophical, and I I think it's it you you read my mind because it's definitely something that's going on on my side of the equation. Is do you vote your conscience or do you go with the you know the electability? Well, here's something yeah. that I was kind of thinking of. Like, So you're registered as a Democrat. Frank, you registered as an independent. I'm technically registered as a libertarian. Mm. And times like these is where I feel like that kind of sucked because there's no, like, I don't get to be involved in, like, this process. Mm-hmm. Like, obviously, like, Trump's going to, you know, take the nomination. Right. So, like, if you if I registered as a Republican, now I wouldn't be doing anything for the caucus anyway. But, you know, in 2024 or whatever, like, I don't, I don't think I get – because I registered as a libertarian to do any of the like, the, no, not here in Nevada. Yeah, not here in some Nevada. states they allow you they, to go. Yeah, and you have to get like, I remember in 2016 there was a big deal because like Gary Johnson got like five percent of the overall vote. So like mm-hmm. now libertarian will be registered as a political party in some states, but it, I don't know, but like voting your conscience, same thing. Like I thought about that at the DMV, like when I was when I registered, I got my ID and I registered to vote, and I was like, shit, should I? Register as a libertarian, or should I register as a Republican so I have, like, I can maybe help shape the Republican Mm -hmm. Party, Mm -hmm. or do I just, like, say, well, I feel like I'm a libertarian, so I should put libertarian in there. Yeah. And now I kind of back, like, I'm regretting that. Tell me, am I wrong on this one? So, in some states, even if you're a registered Republican, you can go vote Mm -hmm. in the Democratic, right? Yeah, I believe so. I think that's the way it was in Texas. Like, uh, that shouldn't be right. Mm Mm-hmm. Because then, are you voting like you're basically? Yeah, you go over to mess mess things up. Yeah, you're, you you're negating to. other people's votes because you're like, oh, well, who's the weakest candidate? We'll give him votes to punch up his numbers, but or I, or whoever's in second place. Yeah, we'll go ahead and pad their. You know, I mean, people are going to do that anyway yeah. if that's what they decide to do. But it should be, you know, that's something that Trump talked about in the last week. Was he was actually using that as a punchline? Like he went to New, I think it was he was in New Hampshire, and he was saying, "Yeah, you know, at the rally, uh, so I've, I've, some people are saying that some of you may go over to the Democratic primary and vote for the weakest candidate. Boy, I'd sure hate to see people do that. Like, just said that, and I know that some people think that way or they do it, but president shouldn't, president shouldn't say that. That's." That's gross. 
You're going to have to get rid of that terminology. The president shouldn't say that. Yeah. No, listen. Well, here's the thing. I'm, 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 uh, uh, yeah, I know all bets are off, but I mean, that's just one of those things like you just kind of like, oh, really, that's never come up before, at least not publicly. But, uh, I, yeah, it, I think, Mikey, to your, your point, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people just see it as like, like a jersey they're putting on, you know, like right. it's a moment of declaration. But there's, I don't think there's really a point to doing it. Ah, uh, dude, I have never realized, and I don't know if it's because maybe just mm-hmm. of coming of age, mm-hmm. I have never realized that this whole Democrat-Republican thing is all about teams. Oh, yeah. It yeah. has nothing to do with what's right and wrong. Because every time if I point out something right that Trump does, if yeah. there's people on the, the – they'll disagree with me. They'll mm-hmm. find some way. I'm like – I'm like, hey, man, I'm not saying the guy is not a dick. I'm just mm-hmm. saying, like, hey, this was a good thing here, right? Mm-hmm. Like, look at how this worked out. And then vice versa. You point out something wrong or right, you know, oh, well, you know, this was a good idea or a bad idea. Then the Trump people are like, no, it wasn't. I'm like, really? I mean, whether or not you want to vote for the guy, you can't say that that wasn't what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. I'm like, wow. Like, People just seem don't seem to just choose it issue by issue. It's like they have one side of the fence they run on, and that's it, man. Like do or die. Like like a fanatic loyalism loyalty to your party. I, I don't know, man. I just well, can I, don't I hate this party system? Do well, I listen, really do? But can I can I pitch something to this roundtable atheists here? Um, that's you, right, Mikey? Yeah. You're in with us. Okay. Even though the last time I voted, yeah. I had to go to a church to vote. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I oh, almost, yeah, that I almost a lot. burst in flames. Yeah, right. I, I made it out. Well, that is what I refer to as faith based politics. And that is something that you see on both sides of the equation. I mean, the evangelicals are always the loudest ones in the room. But that's, you know, how often do you, to take that political analogy, how often do you, you know, present one of those uh, types with a, like, a, a, a question of logic, and they immediately go, what does my book say, right? Yeah. Let me run, okay, well, I know it, because it, uh, this is all, okay, uh, it's in the no column. That's a no for me, mm-hmm. right? No, let me think this through. No, every situation is different. Let me apply it to modern standards. And so I think what happens with that is, were you a Republican or a Democrat? I found that, so back to when I ran for mayor of Fort Worth, Texas, you didn't have to declare a political party. So we were all independents. Mm-hmm. There was a guy that got up at one of the debates and demanded that we all declare, are, are we Republicans or Democrats? He wanted to go right across the roster and have every one of us declare which one we were. And you don't have to. But he could not fathom, I can't just sit here and weigh who Who's, speaks to me. Right? They're not wearing their jerseys. I need right. you to declare so I can quit having to think about this. And that yeah. is a huge problem. And yeah, I, it's great. But I mean, going back in history, George Washington and stuff, they didn't want parties, right? Like this party system, I don't think was, I mean, what's the point of it? I don't understand why we have parties. I mean, wh- honestly, why can't it just be on an individual you know, concept of, okay, what are we going to talk about today? All right, this. All right, cool. Well, uh, vote yes or no. But but it seems like everything has an agenda first based upon party yeah. before anything else. I think that's just because there's strength in numbers and you're going to have to have an organization. And again, it goes right back to religion. <laughs> what happens with religion? You know, the, you know, the, the Catholics will be over on this corner and the, you know, the, the, the Baptists are over on the other and the Baptists are going, man, the Catholics are out producing us. We gotta, we gotta make more Baptists and quit. No, I'm more you against know? parties I mean, now that I'm even against lobbyists. Like uh, for okay, a while there, yes, I thought yes. lobby, I thought the lobbyist system is like, look, it's awful. This not basically money influences. I'm like, yeah, but because there's teams. If mm-hmm. there wasn't teams, the lobbyist system wouldn't be as influential as mm-hmm. it is now. Mm-hmm. You know, like would people be able to have a say in government? Yeah, they would, but. Now it's like, well, you're going to have to court person by person by person by person mm-hmm. and not just have it to, well, I courted this guy. And now the rest of his team is going to support him because we're in on it. And it's like, ah. I had this very argument with Alex Jones when I was on his show about political campaign fund because that was something he and I could both agree on. 
Mm -hmm. And I said, that's the problem, is, is neither side will in unison support across-the-board campaign finance reform. And, and in terms of lobbying, I said this. I said, all right, Alex, what is wrong with saying that if you serve a cabinet position— that you uh, you cannot be a lobbyist What's his anymore, name, uh, right? Uh, now, now here's here's what he said. Who's our Mormon guy? Um, Romney. Romney. He's trying to get that put forward, isn't he? Uh, uh, no, no, I not Romney. About that. But here's what one you're of them was trying to put in campaign or uh, term limits for. That was well, Ted Cruz tried Ted for Cruz, term limits. Thank you, yeah. Sir. Are, wait, are you and, talking about term limits of of elected officials or yeah, cabinet and members? Also talking about the minute you yeah. left. Yeah. For five years, you couldn't become a lobbyist. Well, Obama put a a a voluntary. I mean, he just made it a rule in his administration that there was a a period, like a waiting period or whatever, before you could be a lobbyist. But that's not enough. That's what I'm talking about. Is you say because the problem is you don't make the money in government. You make the money after you leave the government. You were the energy secretary, and now you go lobby for the coal industry, whoever's paying you. That's where the money is. So my proposal was no. You say, look, you want to you want to be in uh, the president's cabinet. That's fine, but you are now disqualified from working as a lobbyist. And Alex said in response, he goes, he. He wasn't opposed to the idea in principle, but he's like, well, you need a constitutional amendment to do that. Great. You know, we don't, I don't like the idea of amending the Constitution very much, but that sounds like a good one to me. What's wrong with that? Anybody opposed to that? I don't know. Yeah. The only problem is the people we need to make that happen. Yes. <laughs> they have the most to lose by making That's that right. happen. They're the ones who, That's yeah. right. You know, it's like going to a guy going, hey, I need you to go ahead and vote for you to get your to lose your job. Yeah. Uh, and listen. No. This, and that's the thing with term limits, too. It's hard. Yeah. That, yeah. You know. And this is what comes back to me voting my conscience because this is something to me on the, the Democratic side of the equation this time around that is disgusting. That we have not one but two billionaires blowing up this thing with money. Uh, Tom Steyer <laughs> has I I I have to wedge my mail out of my mailbox every day now <laughs> because he hits me up five six times a day with a different piece of mail. Mike Bloomberg is doing something to, that I think is even more offensive than that. He's paying like Instagram accounts to make him look cool and like yeah, post well, memes about him. And he stuff. is doing yeah. that, but what he's really doing is he's intentionally skipping early states so he doesn't have to get on the debate stage and and speak for himself. He's just going to do the money dump on Super Tuesday. So, like for example, today he actually qualified. For the debate stage in Nevada, Andrew Yang would have been delighted about that. I'll bet Bloomberg's actually upset that he did because his his best scenario would be that he just sits out, waits for Biden to falter, does the big money dump, and then and then takes spot. What what Bloomberg would like to be is it would like he would like it to come down to a two person race between him and, and Bernie. So Bernie mm -hmm. can be the liberal, and Bloomberg can, you know, appeal yeah, to the moderate Bloomberg crowd. used to be Republican, right? But, but, yeah, he's flipped parties back and forth just like Trump has. But the, the thing about that is that type of money, if you look at, and here I go, American exceptionalism, I'm going to tell you about some other countries, and I know that everything is best in America, no matter what. But hear me out, just like the metric system, there may be something to be said for looking at another way of doing something. I actually have a beef about the metro system. I think this, the base 12 system is better, but continue. There we point. go. All right. All right. I do. It's, it's divisible by more whole numbers, and you have more fractions. So you're doing, when you're dealing with it without a calculator, a base 12 system is divisible by 2, 3, 4, and 6. So you have more whole numbers, whole, more whole fractions, and then like the gallon, quart, pint, cup, is all f whole fractions and when you're eyeballing stuff like you're doing carpentry and like woodworking and stuff yeah. it's so much more easier to eyeball like a half an inch a you know a half quarter eighth sixteenth than it is to deal with like a tenth like you just can eyeball it and oh, you yeah. get closer to measurements so anyway i like the base 12 system i know a lot of people don't but i really do think base 12 is better than base 10 even though we have 10 fingers 
I think base 12 is better anyway. So that was my rant on the base 12 No, it's fine. I like that little. But you know what? We might need to have a new segment. We'll call it like uh, Mikey's America. (laughs) And we we take the thing that that it only happens here, and we'll put you in like a red, white, and blue singlet, and the camera will cut to you. and You'll be like Peter Griffin on what grinds no, your gears. Because yeah. I, I personally would like the metric system. Well, it's easier what, when we're doing weights and stuff and guys are cutting. It's, what I was to go compare ahead. the metric system to, though, is campaign finance reform. Because there are a lot of really successful countries that have can, uh, period limits on campaigns. They say, look, the, your campaign can last this long. And they also have designated amounts of what you can spend on media. And they go, look, you spend this however you want. You take your whole chunk and buy yourself uh, two hours of time on the network and sit there and talk to everybody for two hours. You can spread it out or whatever you want to do. It's, it's not socialism because everybody is – you're putting your money into it. It's just saying we're going to have a cap. We're going to have a cap on how much – it's not everybody gets the same. You may have more campaign contributors, so that means you'll have more money to spend – but you can't dump your $83 billion into a campaign. And here's the problem. You're not going to buy – like, it doesn't matter, Tom Steyer, how many flyers you put in my mailbox. I'm not ba- voting based on I've seen your name more than anyone else. You, you won't. That's it. Yeah, I won't, but won't, somebody but else will. Most and that's will. the problem. And yeah. that, those are the people that we've got to I mean, that's how the look whole- out for. That's how our whole uh, economy is set up on. I mean, think about mm-hmm. it. You're getting hit. Like, well, why did you buy the aftershave you bought? Why did you choose that deodorant? Why yeah. did you buy that car? You see that's something true. enough times that's advertised. It's getting. I mean, that's a psychological, actual, you know, uh, 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 fact. Yeah. You know, it, I, I know repe- if I, repetition I, causes it to. I don't know if I told you this or not. I've been trying to. I've been trying to get this joke to work in my stand-up act. Story of my life, right? You're like, yeah. What else is there? <laughs> well, no, I've been trying to get a joke. To, the premise of the joke is this. Everybody talks about Russian interference in 2016, and they were buying phony Facebook ads or whatever, right? But. Where's the blame for the Americans? Because even if that happened, even if the Russians dumped all this money into buying Facebook ads, they couldn't make us stupid. Like, we had to do that part on our own. So if you saw some phony story Mm -hmm. that you only saw on your friend Cindy's Facebook page, that's the only place that you saw this story come up anywhere, and you didn't have the thought to think, boy, I might need a second source on this. If I had a nickel for every time someone sends me an article from The Onion, yeah. Thinking it's Thinking fucking it's real. real. I'm just like, there's a whole subreddit about like that. People reacting mm-hmm. to onion stories. They like yeah. they're real. It's pretty funny. Yeah. yeah. So my yeah exactly. So the joke. So that was my joke, right? I was thinking people would laugh when you go, yeah, but they can't make us stupid. Like, you know, anybody who is seeing a story on their friend's Facebook page and that's the only place they see it, and they buy. But then I realized part of what I was saying in that joke was, who gets their news from fucking Facebook? And then I saw a poll, half. Fifty yeah. percent of Americans say Facebook is their primary news so source. Half, so half the room at the Strat is going, yeah. "Man, fuck this guy." Are there, or, well, well that or worse. <laughs> oh, where's uh, is he going to? Where's the joke? <laughs> I mean, he's talking about how we get the news from Facebook. Right, I a, get that. I do that every day. Right. Yeah. Where's the? Is there going to be a funny part? You know yeah. what about like the Facebook news that like gets people to share? I feel like old, like older people do. Uh-huh. It's like only the brave will share this story. Oh like, yeah, I bet yeah, this yeah, won't yeah. get one like. Yeah, like those right. kind of tags, yeah. they those like get. I feel like those get like people my parents' age and older mm-hmm. to like it's like automatic. Well, I'm brave. I'm gonna you know. Yeah. But like you know, it's like if you like you know like for Donald Trump, like ignore for Hillary. Like oh shit, I better like this. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, or, or that well, kind of stuff and, like really gets. And the other thing too yeah. with these algorithms, it can start closing your your bubble. Yes. Like Mikey and I were talking about mm-hmm. this the other day because. Of all the Tom Steyer ads, right? And, if, you know, he's going by IP addresses. Like Mikey was talking about how, you know, every other ad on YouTube is a Tom Steyer ad. Well, yeah, you know, he's they're targeting Nevada and Vegas and all that kind of stuff. Same thing's happening to me. But now when I think about it, and especially as we go to streaming services, so like Hulu, you mm-hmm. know, all that kind of stuff, they can – Focus all that, our Twitter timelines on, well, this is based on the people you follow, and this is what we're going to show you, and this, more importantly, this is what we're not going to show you. Now, I will always go outside of social media to get news, and this is why 
Um, is it Ted Koppel, maybe Sam Donaldson? I saw somebody say this recently, an old school news guy. But they were asked about: Is it good that that media basically has become democratized? You know that anybody can po- can be a citizen journalist. And they were like, in some ways, yes, but in a lot of ways, no. And I agree with that because it's like the same upside, which is anybody can have a platform, is. Any unvetted, you know, you, mm-hmm. you think you could trust people to go, okay, well, I don't know who Mikey is. Like, I got to – let me look into what his background is. I agree is, with you. It's a double-edged sword because in one instance, you know, back in the 60s, if, if, if the powers that be wanted to hide a story or bury it, they knew what lines it could come through and they could bury it. Yeah. But now, you know, look, information, look, at, it's a, look how controlled China is and information still gets through. You know, how they're, you know, underplaying the amount mm-hmm. of infections that are happening because of the, uh, the, you know, the, the coronavirus. So in that instance, yes, you're right. The fact that everybody has a platform is awesome because you can't hide the truth. But the problem, you're right, is that the truth hides amongst a bunch of bullshit now. It's almost like it's the opposite, where it's like, well, now I'm not, I'm not confused from a lack of information. I think the average person, I mean, hell, I have to go on Snopes so much because there's so much information out there. That, and, and some of it is not as... As, as obvious, yeah, obvious is a Reddit article, or excuse mm-hmm. me, you know, the uh, uh, Onion article. We were right. like, all right, guys, two sentences into that, you really didn't realize that, that was a joke. There are times I'm reading stuff and I look at it and go, I, I don't know, that that could be real. It could, maybe, hold on, let me mm-hmm. let me go, and then you have to, you know, follow it up with research. And I mean, most people aren't going to do that, mm-hmm. and so I think that's the problem that you're talking about, like. Before, if if you as a journalist come out and say some outlandish MMA uh, story, yeah. you're going to be held accountable for it. Now you no longer can have a credential to go to That's a fight. That's it, yes. So yes. Now, yes. now you are being punished for bad stories. Yeah. It's like, well, you completely fabricated a story between you know the, this situation. Well, now we know we're going to punish you. So that holds you to a certain level of accountability where you're like, well, look, my integrity – on top of job security, if I just spew out complete bullshit, I'm going to lose my uh, my my access to that information. Yep, hundred percent. I did like so that's Watergate, right? So like the Washington Post. I mean, that took forever to come out, and the reason it took forever to come out is because Bill Bradley, the the uh, editor of the Washington Post, was like. We are staking our entire reputation on this. Like, we're about to call the President of the United States a criminal, and you better be damn sure that it's for real, right? But the upside of that is that because that reputation meant everything, there wasn't a lot of question. I mean, there was questioning of it, but when it came out, it was an accepted account, and it turned out to be true. Nowadays, if something like that happened, the Washington Post, they might come out with, you know, Nixon's running a slush fund. Well, the conspiracy theorists would be like, yeah, but over there at the truth is out there among us dot com. They're saying that Hubert Humphrey's running a, a pedophile ring out of a pizza place. And there's ju- and then a bunch of people would believe that, you know, just because there there's a false equivalency of that. There's no there's no vetting process anymore for that media. But I guess what I'm saying is we can't it's going to take generations to make everybody smarter. Which, as listen, Mikey, please, I employ, I implore you, as a about to be parent, do your part. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you will. I have faith in you. I know Frank does. But uh, that, if that ever gets fixed, that'll be long after we're all gone. But what we could do for right now is change the way money is infused into campaigns. Mm-hmm. And the only way, and you know what? Here's the thing. If everybody got together, and Mikey's right, you know, the, the politicians are the ones who have the most to gain from avoiding that, but if 99% of, it wouldn't even have to be 99%, but let's say 99% of us got together and said, time's up, it's happening now, and we're going to have a purity test on it, and if you're not signing on, I don't back you, there'd be a come-to-Jesus moment. Okay, uh, we're running out of time, so, but I have this thought you know it was, i love post apocalyptic movies yeah, i always think that's cool you know you know running around in a four wheeler fucking you know guns and and, and survival yep. and battling and i'm like 
wow, you know, like, but always in the back of my mind, I'm like, nah, it's never going to happen. Then I started thinking about it the other night, like I was sitting in bed, I'm like, oh, wow, it could happen. We could have a crazy war break out here in the U.S. If Trump loses the election and it's close, I, I'm almost 100% he's not going to vacate the office. And I don't even think it has to be close. I'm with you. Yeah, and I think that there's going to be a strong group of supporters that are going to, you know what I mean? Like like what happened up in uh, Nevada? Oh, with the Bundys? Yeah, but imagine <laughs> that times a hundred, times a thousand. Yeah. That's what I foresee happening. I, I think we very well could in the next... Uh, 12 months or you know or what 10 months to the election I, I listen I'll tell you what he's going to be wearing when it happens I said this from day one this thing ends one of two ways with Trump either wearing a military uniform or a bathrobe one of the two when they do pull him out of there eventually it he's going to be wearing one of those two he's either going to look like one of those banana republic dictators with all the medals he gave himself yeah. on his chest or uh he's going to be wearing a bathrobe we're running out of video card. No. So I don't know if you have. It sounds like a conservative conspiracy theory to me. <laughs> oh yeah, look at that. We're running out of video. Yeah. All right. Well, listen. I actually, I don't. I had to tell you, I don't think that this that's all, that's a very healthy conversation. I don't think it's a particularly partisan one. I mean, I just laid out to you a whole bunch of problems that are going on on the left side of the political equation with billionaires getting involved and that's yeah, yeah. that's why i voted the way i voted cards full i don't know oh, no nope. we really are out of time all right well now you're looking at a black screen and uh that means that we did uh really run out of uh available room cool. on the card that's okay though frank uh while people stare at a handsome logo of uh the two of us why don't uh, you tell everybody uh, about how they can support the show yeah, by clicking on uh, phoneboothfighting.com, go on our Amazon banner, click there, and use that to purchase all your uh, shopping needs. And a small percentage that comes back to here at the show at no extra cost to you. And remember also, too, to go on any of my social medias and see Mitrospec and also uh, American Shaman. It really has been mm -hmm. doing uh, wonders for my body. And uh, any questions and stuff, give me a ring on my, or give me a uh, a message <laughs> yeah i'm message getting old I'm starting all to right. say phrases <laughs> all right uh mikey i'm checking my i got uh 11 days and counting here yep for you okay yeah. so all we're right. getting we're getting super close all right now does that mean you get to podcast next week potentially we yeah we're, we're kind of we're kind of on baby watch so could we have, happen it could well, actually, happen next week's gonna be my last day in studio for about a month oh yes you're about to go uh Tour the world. I'm gonna go on a European family vacation. Just yeah. Like, well, oh, I've seen that daughter, movie. Yeah. Father yeah. daughter vacation. <laughs> yeah. Me and Bella. Yeah. Traveling the world, mm -hmm. studying and training and teaching martial arts. Yeah. All right. It's a cool life. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll get another one in next week before uh, Mikey has to go become a dad. But if, he, if he's out, that's okay. We'll 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 get one done anyway for you guys, and then we'll have some international editions. All right for uh, Frank Mir and for Porno Mikey doing a great job producing over there as always, and uh, for Sadiq Yusuf who joined us earlier. I'm Richard Hunter. We'll see you right back here next time on Phone Booth Fighting.